Hey everybody, this is Chrissy and I am so glad that you are back on Coach's Corner. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to everybody, all our supporters, all our listeners, those who are covering us in prayer, those who are giving donations. We just want to give you a big shout out and say thank you. So today I am here with Coach and we are starting a new uh, session series and we're going to talk about grief. And I, I think this is really good for us, everybody, because so many times we process grief and we think that grief is just a time of when you lose a, a loved one, a parent, a, a spouse, a child. But Coach and I are going to go into a little bit deeper topics about grief and how we deal with it on a daily basis in every area of our lives. What do you say, Coach? I think that's awesome. Um, you know, Chrissy, since we started since you came on the very first time, I don't know if you can remember, but I can still remember. We were talking about the bondage that you were in. We were talking about even myself growing up. Yeah. We talked about bondage. We talked about the area in life that we needed to be free from. And then being able to go through the process of um, living in that bondage and then working through the process while you were coming through set free, watching your kids still grow going through the tension, going through the misadvantages of life and all these different things. And then we got into the whole thing of what we dove into, but it was a rough month because we were talking about triggers. Oh yeah. Remember that? <laughs> yes. That was, that was a, hard. Yeah. That was, hard. that was a total, like a good friend of mine, ours, Cynthia Basin says it was a shabackle. Uh -huh. So you know, getting through the triggers and then co going into a new season. It was the month of June. Yeah. Your daughter graduated. My son graduated. Um, Holly went through a transition. I was going through a transition and still going through that transition. You were going through the transition with your daughter and, you know, yeah. and just, just life itself. And then different promotions and jobs and all these different things going on. And so I'm really blessed that you chose to talk about grieving yeah. because it hit me when you said, you know, coach, let's talk about grieving because of the seasons that people have gone through and that are continuing, continuing to go through now. Yeah. And so when I, when I started to really pray about it and think about it, it was the Lord dropped it in my spirit to grieve is to live mm -hmm. because in the grieving as you would agree, there's freedom that comes from that. Absolutely. Right. And so yeah. let's dive into that and let's just talk about how, you know, how people go through the process mm -hmm. and what steps we, you know, we can take and those on the outside looking in, I think this is also going to free them yeah. to understand someone that's going through the grief process. Absolutely. So where do you want to start? Well, uh, I want to start with the conversation that we were having at the house the other day, and it was so profound for me because we were talking about grief, and I remember telling you guys, it, grief is not something that just, like I said before, it's not just the loss of a loved one. So when I begin to kind of dig into what grief really is, the definition that Webster's Dictionary has is a response to a loss of someone or something. Mm. And automatically, Holly just kind of popped it out there and said, an unexpected change of a normal routine. Wow. And that just jumped out. And I mean, that leaped in my spirit because I was like, whoa, 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 say that again. An unexpected change of a normal routine. So for instance, if you do have a loss of a spouse or a child or a loved one, that is, that is a change of a normal routine. But what about all those people? What about all you guys out there that have a change of a normal routine for something totally different? And I'm just going to kind of list a few examples of what I was digging into. Cool. So death or divorce. Sometimes when you have a death, like of a spouse, or if you're go going through a divorce, that can also be a grieving process. A marital separation. Change of churches. Man, when I saw this, I thought, whoa, there's a lot of people out there that change churches and it's kind of like a grieving process because they're like, well, now what do I do? Right. They're like right. a fish out of water. They're not in their little community. It's totally different. They don't know anybody anymore. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, illness. 
So when you start going through a very deep illness, like maybe some of you have gone through cancer or different illnesses, it's like a grieving process that you go through because you're sitting there going, I used to be healthy to do all these things. And now I can't do those things anymore. Um, waiting for marriage. I mean, let's just be real. A lot of single people are out there in a depression and stuck in a grieving process because their spouse hasn't come into their life. And um, I'll just touch on one more. Um, dismissal from work or retirement. So there's a whole list and we're going to put it out there for you guys on the coach's corner, but dismissal of work. So maybe some of you have gone through a change of work, change of job titles, or even you lost your job, you lost your business and, or you retired. So now your change of normal events is completely out of whack. And that's why I really felt the need to talk about grief process coach, because so many of us can totally relate to different areas and it's not just, a death of someone, but it's a death of something. Yeah, totally. So now that now that we have identified the different areas, and there's like a, you know, I mean, you found a lot, like 30, 30 of them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which, you know, it, and, it, and it speaks volumes because there's, there's so many of us out there, including myself, that sometimes we don't feel that we're in a season of grief, but we really are. Right. And we don't know how to get out of it because it could be that job. It could be that um, change of address. It mm -hmm. could be that status quo, whatever you were doing, um, you know, just across the board. Right. So let's talk about the emotional part of these changes. Okay. Like you said, you know, the whole circumstance changing. Um, so it's, it's the process that goes through that. What would you say is the main, not even such, not even so much the main thing, but what are one of the things that people may go through that would um, help them to understand the um, step of their process and where they're at? Well, I remember we're talking about just the stages. So we talked about different stages of grief. Right. And, and believe it or not, guys, there are stages of grief that you have to process. And the stages are denial, isolation, and they go hand in hand, um, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. But today, mm -hmm. we're actually going to touch on the very, very first thing that someone goes through when they process grief, and that's denial and isolation. Wow. And I think that's the hardest part, denial and isolation, because that's step number one, and that's going to be step number one across the board for anybody. Sometimes you go through a state of denial because denial helps you to cope and denial helps you to process and even survive. And I'm just going to share a little bit of my process of denial. Okay. So when my late husband passed away, it was a chaotic mess when we got there to the, the scene. And the first thing that I did was tell myself, this is not real. This isn't true. This right. is a, he's faking this out. Like he's really gone to measures of extreme here to fake us out. Right. <laughs> and I mean, you know, and that would be a stupid thing to look at. And people are like, you are crazy girl. But let me tell you, that is the only thing that kept me in a, in a place of, of sanity in the midst of insanity. And right. we all go through denial processes. So for instance, I'm just going to give an example. So if you go through a divorce, right? I have a good friend of mine that went through a divorce not too long ago. And she's like, well, I don't, I don't really care. I mean, they cheated on me. I don't really want to be with them anyway. So I don't really care. And, and to be quite frank, you do care. That hurt is very real but you deny it to protect yourself. Right. And, and that's actually, um, that could be a very dangerous place. You know, you do have to work through the denial. You have to work through that because if not, believe it or not, coach, if you don't deal with the denial, you're going to go right straight into the isolation. Totally. And that's what I did. And you're, you're very aware of that. Um, the isolation keeps you from everybody who loves you, everybody who wants to help you but it's your form of 
trying to get through this process. And I know you could totally agree with me because denial and isolation, if we can get past that main first step, I'm not going to say the rest is easy peasy because it's not, but you, you gain traction. You start to gain traction on that. And I want you right. to be able to explain something about denial and isolation because I think all of us can identify with that. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that everyone that's listening into the podcast or watching the video um, would understand and agree that we've all gone through some type of relationship that when it was over, the denial kicked in. The denial kicked in that there was even anything that was dysfunctional. The denial kicks in of, of even just the breakup. And I think just from my experiences, I think we want to hang on to the person in this place of, well, we're still friends. Right. To me, that's still part of the grieving process because you still can't let go of something that's, that's there. Right. You're, you're still trying to create something or hold on to something that is not going to go anywhere past the friendship. Now, I get it. There are some instances where they were friends before they got together. They tried being together and then it just didn't work. It was just too brothery, sistery. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just like, yeah, this ain't going to work. You right. know, every time I kiss you, it just feels like I'm kissing my brother or my sister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Whichever end it's on. So the, the truth is, is that the denial, I believe, can be in so many different mm -hmm. circumstances. Whether it's death, widowed, divorce, a job, friendship across the board. And I like what you said about when you deny so much, then, then it goes into the whole isolation area. My isolation and my denial when I was younger, the, you know, those of you who are listening know that my stepfather molested my sister. We've been healed from it. We've moved on. Um, it's, you know, it's 25 years later. And so, you know, we've gone through that process, each and every one of us, each and every one of us have gone through it differently. But the, the truth is, is back then when I was that 12 year old boy, that 13 year old boy, it was, I was in a place of isolation within myself. And the way that I expressed myself was through art. I did a lot of graffiti and learned how to do the graffiti. And that was my pastime. That was where I went that was my own and I found something that no one else could do in my family. No one else could touch it. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so that became my isolation. That became the playground that only I can visit and those people that were in my life, not, not my family, but those who were graffiti artists also, we could all come together and understand each other yeah. in the process of, of artwork, whether they were going through something or not, I could still relate and, and, and isolate myself in a place with someone else that understood who I was. Right. They didn't have to understand what I went through. Right. I didn't even have to talk about what I was going through. Mm -hmm. I was able to live in a world that only they knew. Right. So, as I was just starting to talk about this, this, you know, you know how it is, like things start coming back to you like, oh, wow. Yeah. And it, and it, you know, the Lord just brings it to our, to our spirit to understand the reason my isolation was around everyone else who was graffiti artists or break dancers or anything like that was because now I was in a world that no one else could touch. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful thing. And so you know, there, there's so many different forms of isolation. There's so many different forms. And I believe there's, there's other levels of dealing with grief. Yes. And I really don't, matter of fact, I'm going to let you answer that. Do okay. you think that, that we have to start with step one is denial or are there different um, levels or mm -hmm. are there different steps that a person can take? to be able to get through that grieving process? Um, so for, it's not going to be the same for anybody, for everybody. 
And I'm just going to touch on what you just mentioned about how all of your family has dealt with it and you're free. Each one of you dealt with it differently. Right. So I want to really touch on that because for my family, the death that we had in my family, we all dealt with it differently. So the first step isn't always 100% going to be denial because to be honest, it could be anger. Right. You're angry at what happened. You are angry at the death because you're, you, you just wrote about this, the whys. Why right. did this have to happen? Why did we have to go through this? For me, it was denial. Um, for each of my children, it was completely, like I said, very different. And all of you guys out there, just know this. Your process of grief isn't going to be like anybody else's. Right. And if someone tells you, hey, you've already been going through this enough. You've already like, let's get over it already. Let's move on. Right. They probably, and don't be mad at them because I was, they probably can't understand what you're going through. And I'm just going to be very real because you know I'm just going to put it out there. But I had a lot of people that came to me and would hug me and say, well, because, you know, they didn't know about the situation and how my late husband had molested our daughter and sexually abused me. They, they didn't know. Right. So they were coming from a perspective of, well, you know, God just wanted another person in heaven. Um, I know that you're going to be blessed and, and highly favored of the Lord because of your strength. And I'm just kind of sitting there and each person that's coming up to me, I'm just like, shut up. Break it down, I, Chrissy. Break it down. <laughs> Get real. I don't want to hear all the fluff and, and, and all the BS. And then finally I had some, I had one friend and she came up here and she drove from the Valley to come up here and she was next in line and she hugged me and she goes, I'm not even going to say anything. And she just held me. And I'm like, really like, I'm a little bit agitated because everybody else has already quoted scripture and please don't get me wrong. I think scripture is very important in a time of death. Sure. Absolutely. But, but, but when you're talking to someone who has just processed either a death or a death of something, maybe the best thing you can do is just hug them. And just don't, shut up. And just shut up. You don't have to have the perfect <laughs> word. You don't have to thus say it the Lord. You don't have to tell them, I feel in my spirit that this is what God wants you to hear. Come I, on. Don't, I don't think they need all that Christianese. Come on. I think they just need you to love them in the place of brokenness. Hey man, just that hug that she gave me, she held me for 10 minutes. Right. And at, and at first I was a little bit agitated. And then all of a sudden I just, I just collapsed under that love. Because to be, I didn't want to hear all that junk that everybody was saying. I was angry. Okay. I was angry. I was frustrated. I, I had to do this uh, memorial service under tons of duress. And then I've got people quoting scripture to me and I'm like, okay, I, I, I know the word. I know what the word says, but right, right now I just need you to hold me. I don't need a word right now. I don't need no words. <laughs> I don't right. need anybody to tell me anything. Just love me, just hug me. And, and I just want to share that. I want to be so honest with you guys out there because you, maybe you were the one who offered the wonderful condolences and the scriptures and all that. But just know this, if you've never gone through that type of experience, wow. maybe all you need to do is just love them. Maybe all you need to do is just hug them. And it's okay. Like it doesn't make you less of a Christian if you don't come storming in with your Bible and, and quotes, it doesn't make you less of a Christian. On the contrary, it makes you like Jesus because Jesus just loved on them. Right. You know, and I love all the stories because when that woman that was caught in adultery, he didn't sit there and quote scripture and tell her all these things. He just loved her. Right. And picked her up in her brokenness. So that's where I'm coming from. So I, I just really laid it out there. And <laughs> I, I think you did. You was preaching, which is I a good preaching. thing. It's yeah. a good thing. So what we're going to do really quick is we're going to put a pin in that topic right there. I actually wrote it down right after you said it. Okay. Because when, per, when, when words pop out at me, then it's like, okay, we need to address this. So loving people in their brokenness. Yeah. So guys, we will be right back and we're going to put a pin right in what she just said. We're putting a thumb pack, thumb, 
thumbtack right in her forehead and we're going to wait and we're going to take the small commercial break and uh, we'll be right back and we're going to break down loving others in their brokenness. Yes. All right, guys, we are back on Coach's Corner with Paul and Chrissy. Remember, you can visit my website, setfreelife.net, to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, what we're doing on um, from here on out is we are actually saving and sharing our cliff notes to our, to our podcast, and you can visit that at bit.ly forward slash cc cliff notes. That's bit.ly forward slash CCC L I F F notes. And um, you'll be able to uh, check out all the cliff notes and, um, you know, copy and paste them and just kind of dive into what we're talking about. And a lot of the stuff that we're getting guys is from just from different articles. Also, we don't know everything. And so we, we research, we study, and then we apply it to our life on how it worked for us in all of the different circumstances. And so, like I said, right before the, the uh, commercial break, um, we're going to revisit what you were talking about, Chrissy, about loving the people in their brokenness. Yes. And like you said, Jesus met the woman at the well. The only thing, not the only thing, but one of the most powerful things that stood out to me as I'm remembering that scripture is that she said, you know, I've heard of this Messiah. I've heard of this man. I've heard of this thing. Mm -hmm. And could you imagine her countenance when he said, he who you speaks about, I am he. Right. So that freed her in that moment to understand this that we've been hearing about is no longer this law that we can't cross, you know, all our T's and dot all our I's. Right. This man, this grace is right in front of me in my brokenness. Yes. And so I love the way you were passionate about like, hey, man, just give me a hug. Right. So let's let's visit that. And I know that that we didn't even prepare for loving someone in the brokenness. <laughs> right. But you know how we do it. We keep it real. And, and for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I want us to speak from the heart what it means when somebody loved us in our brokenness. Yeah. So I'll start off. When okay. I was a broken mess before I came to Christ, I had one man that took the time out of his life that poured into me, we would argue, we would fight, we would, I mean, it was crazy, but this is the man that led me to the Lord. Mm. And to be quite honest with you, on Wednesday will be one year since he's passed. Wow. And it just hit me right now while you were talking about love in the brokenness. Mm -hmm. This man loved me in my brokenness. He loved me where I was at. Though it didn't seem like it at the time, right. my heart knew he's putting up with all my BS mm -hmm. for a reason. I don't know what the reason is for, but he's dealing with, he is working it through with me. Now, I'm not walking away from the topic grief. I'm actually diving into the message of grief because yeah. I was going through my grieving for 17 years. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and some people don't realize that it's 17 years or it's 12 years or whatever the number is. Right. Because it was at 12 years of age when we were separated from my stepfather. But how much grief was I dealing with before? Oh, yeah. In the situation. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. So when I met this man, I was 32 years old. I can't even do the math right now, but it's more than 10 years. That's a lot of years of grief, of yeah. grieving through the process of trying to figure out why I was a mess, why I was angry, why I was bitter, because I was going through the process of grief. Right. And so that just ties into what 
you know, graphic that I made the other day of to grieve is to live. Yes. And some people may have looked at that picture as, Ooh, that's kind of a Debbie downer, <laughs> you know, like no shade on anybody who, who, who is named Debbie. One of my good friends is named Debbie. So it's not Debbie's aren't downers, but what I'm getting right. at is that they might've seen that picture and said, I don't, I don't know if you'd want to title something like that, but it, it really spoke to me to say, to, to, to grieve is to live mm-hmm. because if we don't grieve, if we don't go through that process, we're never going to live. Right. And so, you know, share with, share whatever's on, on your heart about how people met you mm-hmm. and loved you in your brokenness and how did you overcome the brokenness through that love? So first of all, I'm just going to touch on the fact that grief is a messy process. And you said it. (laughs) I I had to say that because so many times we feel that we have to be perfect, even in our grieving. Yeah. And I want you guys to be free of that because you have to stop putting on a front that you're okay. I mean, you may be divorced 20 years and you're still hurting. Come on. Because you are denying the fact that, you are hurt. You know, you could be uh, lost a job 20 years ago and you're still angry because of that. So, and I know that from experience because this is what I went through. So in my um, process of someone loving us through our brokenness or just loving me, I'm going to just be me. Right. Um, I was going to church. I was serving in a church. I love the fact that I was growing and learning, but I, I would go to worship and I was broken. Uh, people knew our situation and they kept asking, how can we help? How can we help? So when I was like, okay, should I ask? Cause you know, when you're in a place of, of, of uh, brokenness, you don't want to ask for help. And let's just be real. You're like, you're prideful cause you don't want to ask for help. Right. You think you got it all together. Right. And I finally stepped out and I said, well, I, I need this or I need that. And then nothing happened. Like nobody ever came through. Yeah. And I sat there going, dang, so what do I do? And you have to live up. We, we felt, I felt, I'm just going to speak for me. I can't speak for my kids. So I felt that I had to live up to this image of what others in the church thought I should be at this point in my life. My, my late husband passed away. I needed to move on. I needed to go ahead and serve. So that way I can get better and become a better Christian. Da, 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 da. You can put everything at the end. And really, honestly, I, I was so broken. I didn't, I didn't know what up from down was. I was falling into a very deep depression. Right. And of course, and and for me, I always tell people this always, 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 um, coach and Holly and I call her red and only I can call her red. (laughs) So they were the only ones who literally, you guys were the only ones who loved me in my brokenness. And, And this is why, um, you let me be human and vent you allowed me to cry, to scream. And, and uh, come on, guys, let's just be real. I mean, sometimes I just cuss because I was so mad. I mean, I'm not, not a, a perfect Christian. Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you kicked me in the butt. You picked me up when I fell. I fell a lot. I, a lot of people saw me from the outside thinking maybe she thinks she's all that. She doesn't really talk to anybody. And to be honest, guys, I was just broken. You were hurting. I was hurting so bad. I didn't know how to communicate with people. And you guys really taught me just to be real, just to be honest. And I remember when that mask, and I've talked about it before, and and I love to still talk about the mask, but when the mask finally came off, it was like, oh, so there's Chrissy Moore. Right. Huh. I haven't seen her since, I don't know, 19 maybe? Right. So I was living in a facade, and everybody on the outside was seeing a facade, and that's not who I was. Right. But we feel like we got to be this perfect Christian, this perfect mother or father or, or daughter or son. And, and, and to be honest, God just wants to meet you where you're at, just like the woman at the well. I mean, you just said it. He knew everything about her. He knew all the men that she'd been with. It's not like she could hide it from him. And he even told her about the guy she was with now that weren't even married. Come on. So he knew everything about her. And, and, and not only that, she ran and told the whole town, like, what if the whole town didn't even know about right. her? 
Right. But she ran and said, hey, man, there's this guy, and he just told me everything I ever did. He just read all my mail, and he still loved me. And he still loved me. And that's the part I love. Because when you have those people that God works through, and I'm going to say that again, because so many people think that these people are the saviors, but they're not. It's really the Holy Spirit and the Lord working through you and bread. That's right. And helping me. And you love me right where I was at. It was like, that was a breath of fresh air. Because Amen. it doesn't always happen that way, guys. And I feel in my spirit that maybe there's some of you out there that are going through the same thing or have gone through the same thing. You haven't lost a spouse or a mother or a father, but people have hurt you. And right. they said, Hey man, I've got your back. I'm going to be there for you. And then they split. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's a lot of pain because now you're like, I'm never going to trust anybody again. Well, you know, that's, that's the part that will taint a person across the board because yes, first, they lost their trust with the one that they loved. Mm -hmm. And now these people are coming into their life saying, you can trust me. And then when you need them for something, you can't trust them. So it's a double whammy. So now yeah. I believe the person reflects on themselves. Then there's something wrong with me right. because this continues to happen in my life. And so I think it's going to encourage on both sides. Yes. Everyone, be careful who you put your trust in. Yeah. And those who are saying you can count on me, choose your words. Right. Truly choose your words. I've learned in the process, Chrissy, that I don't obligate myself like I used to. Mm -hmm. I used to be an open book and just say, hey, you know, whatever you need, call me. At the end of the day, you know, those three o'clock in the morning calls, Mm -hmm. If you have 10 people doing it, you're going to burn yourself out. Oh, heck yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, you've seen me go through this process of reducing the noise, yeah. reducing the ridiculous, like Cynthia Bazin says, reduce mm -hmm. those things and funnel it down and get focused on what matters. Yes. And, and so I believe that through this process, this isn't only going to help those who are going through grieving but it's going to help those who have to witness someone. Mm. Yes. And those words that Holly and I gave you in that, that night, I could still remember that night. Like, yes. what are you guys doing here? I mean, everything's fine. Yeah. Um, that was all Holy spirit. It's nothing that we read out of a book. Right. It's nothing that, you know, I myself, you know, took notes on. It was like, I'm sitting there watching this woman. And I'm watching this household mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there going, someone needs to give them permission Yeah, that it's okay to be in a mess. Yeah. It's okay to say the wrong word. Yeah. It's okay to throw up the one way sign. <laughs> it's That's okay true. to say, this is, this is, this is not working. Church ain't working. God's not working right now. It's okay for us to release people mm -hmm. to cry. Yeah. To have that moment of silence, to have that moment of, you know what? I'm not going anywhere, but right now I just need to be isolated for the next day. Can I just be isolated? Yeah. It's okay to go through those processes. Now, if you feel in your spirit that that person is not quite there to be mm -hmm. isolated in this crazy moment, then yes, we must take precautions. Or if we're hearing right. someone say, you know, I just want to end it all. Right. Okay. Well, let's, let's really deal with that and really just pick up the phone mm -hmm. and be concerned and call 911. Right. Call the, the suicide hotline number Absolutely. and say, Hey, this, this person's contemplating. What do I do? You know, Call a pastor, call someone, yes. do something. But, you know, I really think that we have covered a multitude. And I really feel that this podcast is really going to, you know, infect some lives with some hope. Yeah. What do you think? I think so, too. I think that just being real and, and getting alone with God on your own, not with a group of people, not what everybody else thinks, 
but you just going to him and, and being real with him. Right. And, and you just said, and, and give yourself that permission, everybody. Give yourself that permission to not be that perfect mother, father, friend. You know, you're in a place of, of brokenness and you're going to go through the process. It's okay. Right. It's okay to cry. And I love that you said that because sometimes so many people, including myself, thought that if I cried, it was a sign of weakness. But when I cried that day, that wasn't just a little boo-hoo. And it, I had to keep my emotions right now because I remember that cry came from so far down in my belly that I literally screamed it out. I don't know how to grieve someone that I hate and someone that I loved. And when I voiced that out into the atmosphere, it's as if a, a ton of weight had lifted off of me. And sometimes that's mm. what we need. We need to voice it out to someone who we can trust, to the Lord himself. Hey, I need, I need help here. I cannot, right. I cannot do this right now. I need your help. I don't need all, like you said, the noise. Yeah. I, I need I need the still small voice. You know, I don't I don't think there's any true bullet point outline remedy right. that can fix a grieving process. Mm -hmm. But we do know the one answer, and that's Jesus. Yes. That's being able to count on him and watch him work through our life. Yes. Instead of having to deal with grief, we walk through this thing called grief. Yes. Amen. And so, you know, we just speak hope into the atmosphere. Um, as, as we wrap this podcast up and as we wrap up this, this, this topic for this week, we're just going to believe that through these words, yeah. as you said, give the, give yourself permission to cry, mm -hmm. give yourself permission to grieve. You may have to go through that process guys. Even in something that you feel that isn't affecting you, there just may be something that is still affecting you. Yeah. And so we are going to bring hope, number one, by saying this. Number one, give yourself permission. Mm -hmm. What was bullet point number two? It was, actually, number two was give yourself permission. The number okay. one was face your feelings. Yeah, admit, recognize. Admit, yeah, recognize. Recognize that, that you're in a, in a state of grieving. Number two, give yourself permission to, to grieve. Yes. What else? What and, number, and number three is express yourself in a healthy way. So for some people, it could be like Paul did graffiti and art. You know what yeah. I mean? For some people, it's journaling. For some people, it's exercise. Yeah. For some people, it's gardening. But that's a healthy way to just go dive in and do stuff. And, and you're processing as you're doing. It's not like you're forgetting about it. You're just processing it. But you're not bottled, bottling it up inside and not doing anything about it. You're going through the motions. Not even going through the motions. You're going through your healing. You're going yes. through, through your process. Yeah. And so, guys, we're going to wrap this thing up. Chrissy, I am so grateful for you sharing and being transparent and yeah. really opening up your heart in this podcast because – it is a, a real problem that we have. Yes. And like we always say, we're real people with real problems that want real results. Yes. So guys, if you need a coach, if you need a mentor, you can reach me at setfreelife.net. You can go to my email, set for, uh, recoverycoach at setfreelife.net. Reach out to us. Chrissy, why don't you give them your, your information also so they can reach you? Mm -hmm. So you guys can reach me on my Facebook like page, which is Broken Beautiful Ministries, or I have a blog that I do, and it's uh, bit.ly forward slash Broken Beautiful blog. And please reach out and share your comments. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. So you heard it, guys. And remember, life is better when you're laughing. Once again, this is Polly Barra, your life recovery coach, helping you experience freedom so that you can walk out your God-given purpose. We'll see you next time, guys. And remember... Everything is a process. Walk through it. Yes. And if you need us, but most importantly, pray. Yes. If you need us, reach out to us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.